in the name of the one holy triune God. Amen. So the parable we heard just read has perplexed many and offended even more. And as a person who has stood in one pulpit or another for a number of years, I have labored mightily to avoid it. <laughs> but I thought today, let's look at this. This parable, I imagine, is probably in the tradition which led us to the Gospel of Matthew combined with two different parables, one about a wedding banquet. There is a parallel in the Gospel of Luke, quite a bit less sociopathic, but still there, the same basic story. And then there is a parable about having a wedding garment. I believe these were combined in the telling of these stories, and I believe the shape, particularly, of the wedding banquet piece reflects the lived experience of those early Christians who strongly influenced the Gospel of Matthew in many places with their experience of persecution, violence, rejection by family and friends, eviction from the synagogues, and other difficulties which they have read into this story. I'd like us today to focus, if we will, on the wedding garment. Some might wonder how it comes to be that the invited guests having failed, everyone is just compelled to come in from the streets, and yet this person is criticized for not being appropriately, addressed, appropriately dressed for the event. What is that about? Well, one answer I found from James Allison, who is a gay Roman Catholic biblical scholar and theologian. His interpretation of this event is written in his book, Raising Abel, where he says, let us remember that this business of not wearing a wedding garment cannot be read as a reference to someone's moral behavior. For Matthew has emphasized that all were called in, good and bad alike. Besides, it is known that the custom of that age and place was to provide tunics to place over one's street clothes so as to participate in the wedding party, and which would have been at the disposal of all the guests on their way in without the slightest consideration for how good or bad they were. Here is something of what we had in the previous parable of the wicked tenants. The problem with the silent guest is that he does not imagine himself to be at a wedding banquet, but in a place of judgment, and for this reason does not dare to speak when he is addressed, and so receives treatment according to his imagination. If Allison is correct in his interpretation, the problem with the silent guest is not so much that he was poorly dressed, he was not dressed any different than anyone else who came to that wedding. It's that he refused or failed somehow to accept what he had been offered as all the others were offered as well. The wedding banquet is a gift, and the garment for the wedding banquet is also a gift. And the nature of a gift is that it only becomes a gift when it is received. I can intend to give you anything I possess or anything I'm able to do, but if you are not willing to take it from me, then there has been no giving. If I impose this on you against your will, then it was never a gift in the first place. God, in this parable, is offering the gift of entrance into the kingdom of heaven, pictured as a wedding banquet. Those who would participate in that banquet need to accept that gift. 
They need to receive it into themselves. They need to wear it like a garment. They need to take it as the gift it was intended to be, or it will never be what it was intended. So Daniel Berrigan writes about this parable. The one who tells the story knows both goodness and wickedness because he is good, consistent, and compassionate. He longs to see humans standing in the orbit of God's love. He rejoices to see the speechless and poor, the nobodies, at his table. In our story, he condemns no one, not even the king. <laughs> Such judgment is redundant, the royal behavior being self-condemned. And to sum up matters, in utter contrast to the worldly king, the storyteller will give his life rather than take life. Jesus gives life rather than take it. But the life he gives us, we have the option to receive or reject. It is an offer. It is an invitation. It is not a requirement. It is not a demand. One of the ways in which we clothe ourselves with righteousness, one of the ways in which we take on the garment for the wedding feast, is through our giving of ourselves, our gifts, our prayers. This day, on this ingathering Sunday, we take the opportunity to offer our prayerful faith promises for the future, to lay them before the altar, to bless them, and in that blessing, receive blessing for ourselves. It's not a demand. It's not a requirement. It's an opportunity to give. One of the things that I still admire about the Methodist Church in which I was baptized and raised and in which I served for some years, one of the things I admire is the membership vows of the Methodist Church. When you are confirmed and join the church, you are reaffirming the baptismal vows that you took or that were taken on your behalf before. But every time, if you move to a new church, if you join another congregation, you are invited to present yourself before the congregation and to reaffirm those vows and to answer two questions. One, will you support the United Methodist Church? But two, will you support this local congregation through four things? Your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. Prayer is the first promise and the most important one, the one from which all the others flow. We are invited as we take on the wedding garment, we are invited to keep the church in our prayers. This is something that all of us can do. Whatever we possess or don't possess, Whatever our strengths or our weaknesses, whatever our health or our sickness, whatever our age, whatever our station in life, we can uphold the church in prayer. And I can tell you, after 40 years in ordained ministry, that matters. It matters to know that people are holding you up in prayer. It matters that people are holding the church up in prayer. We are invited to pray for our clergy, for our staff, for our lay leadership. We are invited to pray for all those who take part to make the life of this church flow from week to week and season to season and year to year. We are invited to pray for ourselves and each other as a body. And that prayer, in word or in thoughts too deep, four words is the first and most important gift we can give. Secondly, we are invited to support the church through our presence, through being here. 
Christianity is an incarnational faith. We have practiced an embodied religion. It matters that we are here together. It matters that we take part in the same room, in the same building, in the same city, on the same street. It matters that we're here together. We are, after all, social primates. We need each other's presence, and the church needs our presence. In recent years, we have also discovered ways to be present virtually, to be present online, and that's also something that matters. Much has been written about the ministry of presence. It's true in our own lives that there are many things which no one can actually help us with, but the fact that they are present with us makes a difference. There are sufferings which no one can take away, but someone being present with us in that suffering matters. There are needs that only we can provide for ourselves, but having someone present beside us on the way makes a difference. It makes a difference that we are here and not somewhere else, that our minds are here and not somewhere else, that our bodies are here and not somewhere else. In our life of prayer, we are also invited to be present. And in our life of prayer and presence, we are then invited to also give our gifts. We all have gifts that we could share, some more privileged than others. All our gifts are gifts of grace. As Christians, we remember that all we have and all we possess is a gift that we have been given. Many of us have the privilege of being paid justly and fairly for our labors. Many of us have the privilege of having received from the past, from our ancestors, resources and opportunities to move further ahead. Each of us, however successful we may be in our different ways, stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and trade in the things that God has given us all. We give our gifts to help maintain the life and service of this community. The church has salaries that have to be met. It has bills that have to be paid. It has utilities that need to flow. It has physical plant that needs to be maintained. And while all is a gift of grace, I have not noticed in 40 years that it has ever happened that the pastor and the church board gather around a table and pray and the heavens open up and money comes down. <laughs> I have never noticed that to happen. How God has provided for the church is through you and me and all of us together. As we pray, as we make ourselves present, we also give out of the goodness and grace that has been given to us. And finally, we support the church through, its, through our service, through our willingness to, take a, to give a hand, to take a part, through our willingness to stand on the front lines, to work inside this place and within its ministries, and also to assist in working outside this place feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, welcoming the refugee, inviting those who had not heard or did not believe that the love of God was for them as they are, who they are. In these ways, we give of ourselves to the church. In these ways, we put on the wedding banquet the wedding garment, and we participate fully in the wedding feast of the Lamb. Teresa of Avila is said to have remarked, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. 
Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Not a requirement, not a demand, but an invitation and an opportunity. I invite you, as we do in a few minutes, to receive our pledges, our faith promises, our annual appeal for the coming year to accept the invitation you have been given to put on the full garment of Christ, to give as you have been given, and to share as you have been shared with. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved, in Jesus' name.